such praises. What an splendor outshines the sun. What an majesty rules with justice. Only a holy God. Come and behold him. The can rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Join us as we confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we often come to you with our problems, but we rarely give thanks when you bring salvation and wholeness. We would rather treat our creator as a vending machine than as the creator of the universe and the sovereign above all. Forgive us, and we pray that our spirits would be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might see you as holy God, loving parent, and source of all life and goodness. May we live our lives worthy of repentance we proclaim today. Let us take a silent moment to confess, confess our personal sins. Hear these words of assurance. As we turn to God and confess our sin, we realize that God is already with us, ready to hear our confession and forgive our sin. You are loved beyond comprehension, and when you confess your sin, you are washed in the sacrifice and redemption of God's Son, Jesus Christ. It is into his death and resurrection that you are baptized. It is in his name that you are forgiven. I love you, Lord. Oh, you. 
your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. This is the moment in our service where we greet one another, saying, may the peace of Christ be with you.
do that. And they do it for the whole mouth, too. Nobody is searching it. Just there I am. Well, as much as fellowship is good, we do need to move on to the next part of our service. So please make your way back to your seats as you can. And let's continue to worship God by offering up our tithes and offerings. Amen. Sing up the Lord's goodness, Father of all wisdom, come to remembrance his name. Mercy he has shown us, his love is forever, faithful to the end of days. Come To the darkness, comfort of our sorrow, spirit of our Lord, our soul. Solace for the weary, pardon for the sin, splendor of the living God. Come and our nation, sing of the Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Praise Him with your singing, praise Him with a trumpet, praise God with your little tongue. Praise Him with the singers, praise Him with your dancing, praise God till the end of days. Come let all your nation sing of the Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Bring out the Lord's glory, praise Him with your music, worship the name. Lord God, we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We give you thanks that we have the very opportunity to wake up today and praise you together as the body of Christ that you have called together and brought into this place, into this worshiping community. So Lord, we offer up these, these offerings, these tithes as signs of our obedience, signs of our willingness to continue to follow you, to carry the, the work of your kingdom forward into our own lives, our own homes, and out into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Okay, I'd like to, we're doing things a little out of order today. I'd like to invite all the children forward for the children's sermon.
Make room for me. Oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. Very nice airplane. Well, good morning, everybody. Everybody doing good? Thumbs up if you're doing good. Thumbs middle if you're, eh. Thumbs down if you're not so good. Well, if you're not so good, I hope your day gets better, okay? We have a lot going on today at church. And one of the big things, one of the big things that's happening is related to baptism. Do you guys know what baptism is? No. No? Anybody know? Yeah? That was a pretty good answer. When you put somebody's water on somebody's head and they say they believe in Jesus, that's, yeah, that's the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah? Anybody else? Sonny? I know, that, I know that it involves a bunch of water. It involves a bunch of water sometimes. It can be a little bit of water. It can be a lot of water. Um, it always involves water. But there's always something else involved, too. Do you know what it is, Ellie? The Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. The Holy Spirit is involved, and the Word of God all together with the water are combined. Okay? Some of you guys have already been baptized. You might have been baptized like when you were a little bitty baby like I was. And some of you, you might be waiting to be baptized until you're a little bit older and you can make a confession of faith on your own as an adult confession. Even if you're like 12, it's still an adult confession. Will you guys pay attention? And so the point of all of that, why do we do it? Why do we do baptism? Anybody know? Why bother getting some water sprinkled on your head or getting dunked in the Chena River? Lily? Yeah, to show that you believe in Jesus and also to show that Jesus believes in you, right? When we talk about baptism, it's not only our own confession of faith that's important or the confession of faith that our parents are making. It's also a sign and a seal from God that God loves us forever in Jesus, right? And it's, it's super important. And we see these stories in God's word, like in the book of Acts, where there's complete strangers, strangers that might have been, you know, not welcomed um, in like the temple in Jerusalem or things like that, like with the Ethiopian court guy. Um, but he said, what's to keep me from being baptized? And the apostle Philip said, well, nothing, right? God loves you. And this baptism can be a sign of that, right? All right I have one last question for you. Raise your hand if you've ever had soggy shoes. All right, how do soggy shoes feel? Especially if you have great. Great if it's like a really hot day and it's like cold water in your shoes, right? What if it's soggy shoes and you have to walk five more miles in them? Oof, you're going to have some blisters, my friend. That's, well, that's true. If, if you have soggy shoes in the winter, what happens? That's, that's true. Well, so I had a teacher when I was uh, about your age, and her name was Peggy, and she said, sometimes I like soggy shoes because they remind me of the waters of my baptism, okay? And it was just a, a prompt that, like, if you wash your face, right? How many of you guys wash your face or take a bath or take a shower at least once a month? Yeah? Okay. That's good. That's good. How many of you, how many of you brush your teeth at least once a day? That's good, you should probably do that. Dentists agree, nine out of 10 dentists at least, right? Do you use any water when you brush your teeth? Do you use any water when you wash your face? Yeah. yeah. So every time, every time we splash in the water like that, whether we're taking a shower, taking a bath, brushing our teeth, washing our face, that's a perfect opportunity. It's a perfect, the water is a perfect reminder that we live in God's promises every day. We can remember God's promises. We can remember all the ways that God promises to love us, to give us his Holy Spirit, to have Jesus be our Lord and our Savior, okay? So when you guys uh, are about to see some people come forward and they're going to be either affirming their faith, affirming their baptism and confessing their faith, or being prepared for baptism for the very first time, Right? It all comes back to, to God's spirit, to God's word, and to water. And so every time that you get a little wet, 
right? Maybe if you're just walking in the rain, you can remember God's promises for you, that he loves you, and that he gives you everything that you need to love him back. Will you guys pray with me? All right. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, fold our hands. Can we do that? Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for water. Thank you for your promises in the Bible. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Every time we splash in the water, remind us of your love, remind us of your goodness, and remind us that we belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, now, right after this next part, you guys are going to go downstairs, right, Ms. Karina? But for this next part, I would encourage you to maybe sit on the front rows here, or the second row back, so that you can see everything. You can get a front row seat to see everything that's happening. Can you do that for me? Okay. Now I would like to invite all of our confirmation students forward along with our children's and middle school ministry director, Karina Meneker. You just have a seat right there. You can stand up, son. You guys can stand, like, on that first step. Perfect. So Karina and I have been teaching these students for the last, well, most of these students for the last two years um, and the last year, and we've specifically been preparing them uh, to affirm their baptism and, and or confess, confess their faith and either affirm their baptism or be prepared for baptism in the first place. And uh, we've been covering everything from Old and New Testament to the Lord's Prayer, Ten Commandments, Apostles' Creed, Am I missing anything? All kinds of stuff. But uh, they have uh, read the Gospel of Mark. They have written or reflected on that Gospel. They've done all kinds of assignments, activities, and projects to, uh, to prepare to learn and now to, to confess their faith. Um, and it's an exciting time. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And we also have uh, some folks that are going to be received into membership today, so I'd like to invite them forward. Uh, Judy and Joyelle, Nicole, Theodore, and Constance, and Emma. They could all come forward as well. Maybe we could scoot down some here. I don't know what the best... What's the best plan? Perfect. Okay. So I present this wonderful group of men and women who desire to reaffirm the faith into which they were baptized, or in the case of Kiana and Micah, to affirm the faith into which they're about to be baptized. Yay! We rejoice with you as you claim again the promises of God which are yours through your baptism. Through baptism, we enter the covenant that God has established. In that covenant, God gives us new life. We are guarded from evil and nurtured by the love of God and God's people. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. I ask you, therefore, to reject sin, to confess your faith in Jesus Christ, to confess your faith of the church, the faith in which we baptized. So you're going to answer the following questions with, I do, assuming you do. Okay? Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in this world? Do you renounce Satan and all of his empty promises? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying God's word and showing God's love? All right, this is the next part that I briefed you guys on. 
Everybody together. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Even God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you <laughs> Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come judge the living and the dead. Got an older version here. Everybody's got, remember, learns it a little bit differently, right? That's okay. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay. Questions for y'all once again. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and your gifts, your study and your service, and so fulfill your calling to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Awesome. Question for y'all. Do you, as members of First Presbyterian Church and the Universal Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture these wonderful people by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of his church. Well then, it is my deep pleasure to welcome all of you into membership at First Presbyterian Church. Um, I would like to invite the elders forward to say a prayer of blessing, and uh, Karina's going to lead us on that time with the microphone. And then we have... <laughs> Welcome to the middle of the huddle. Right. Dear God, we thank you for these new members and for these compliments. We ask that you would bless them into new adventures in the family of God as they take up a new role. Would you protect them from Satan and anything that he would whisper in their ears? Would you fill them with your encouragement? And would you help us to encourage them as part of their lives in Christ? Would you show them a good road and have them help each other? We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So... It's really cute when we have a baby and we, as the pastor, I get to walk them forward and say, um, you know, please meet your newest responsibility. But size and age doesn't change that. Each and every one of these people are your newest responsibility. Um, they are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And together as the church, uh, we will continue to do God's work, to encourage one another, to hold each other accountable to God's word, and to grow the kingdom of God. So... Let's welcome them into our church membership. Everybody but the confirmation seat students may be seated. Okay. You guys, we got to keep you up here for one more minute. Yeah. Okay. Um, as they leave, uh, at, like David was saying, we taught on all kinds of things. And one of the things that we taught on was the difference between uh, being Christian and being not a Christian. And one of the things we tried to keep central through all the weeks of classes was not just memorizing things or, um, you know, tackling important and diverse pieces of theology, which we did, the central thing we tried to talk about was Jesus and that he's everything. 
Um, so a quote that we read, and I'm going to read to you, talks about the difference between being a Christian and not being a Christian, and knowing who Jesus is and not. Uh, this is by C.S. Lewis. You may know this. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying that really foolish thing that people always say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this one man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, he did not intend to. Uh, as your gift, you are receiving the book that that quote comes from, Mere Christianity, and in the front of it, it says, this is presented to you on the occasion of your confirmation, June 2nd, 2024, at First Presbyterian Church, Fairbanks, Alaska. May you love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, knowing that he loves you that way too. This is for Sunny. Yay! <laughs> Kayana, Micah, Kyle, and Sarah. And David and I have both read this book, but for me it's been about 20 years. So I'm going to start reading it again this week. So if you guys want to read the first chapter, I'm going to read reading the first chapter, and every once in a while I'll give you a shout out and tell you where I am. So if you want to read some this summer, you can. We are so grateful for you guys. Um, it has been a joy to teach you, and it's going to be a joy to do more. All right. Thank you all. You may, you're dismissed for now, but may God continue to bless you in your faith journey. And and uh, little ones, you may now go downstairs with Miss Karina for a little while before we bring you back up for communion. As, uh, as you noticed, uh, there is a lot going on today, and uh, it's, it's a blessing. It's, it feels like a, a triple blessing uh, to be able to do both communion uh, with our church and uh, baptism uh, on my birthday. So it's, it's a real privilege, but that also means that um, with everything going on, we will not be having uh, the prayers of the people. Uh, come back next Sunday. We'll definitely have more sharing time during the prayers of the people. But this is also your monthly reminder that we will have prayer ministers available uh, during communion and right after service, uh, just here uh, by the window side. So if you're on this side of the, the congregation and you're coming up for communion, just take a right turn and uh, you can receive prayer ministry uh, right after communion as well. Uh, the wonderful uh, prayer ministers that are gifted in that area and we're grateful for them. Uh, also, uh, we have a new gluten-free option uh, today and they are in the inner ring of the, uh, the communion uh, the, the juice holders, the juice cups. And so uh, if you need a gluten-free option, uh, don't uh, just, just kind of signify that you're taking from the, the inner ring there and I won't try to put some glutinous bread in your hand. Okay, I think that's all the other housekeeping. So would you please pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks that we could be here today, that we could welcome so many people into church membership especially those students who have spent weeks and months and even years preparing to confess their faith, to admit that they need Jesus just as we admit that we need Jesus. And so, God, we lift up our hearts, and we lift up those things on our hearts that are too much for us to bear. God, we pray for those who are hurting, those who have been hospitalized who are undergoing ongoing treatment for diseases, illnesses, injuries, cancer. God, we ask that you would not only bring them comfort, not only bring your presence, 
but that with your comfort and presence, you would bring healing to them. And God, we pray for those nurses and doctors who do so much healing by the gifts that you have given them, by your very hand upon them. God, we ask that you would encourage them as they bring healing to the lives of many. And God, we pray for those parts of the world that are ravaged, ravaged by the effects of sin, hatred, and anger. God, we pray for an end to the violence, an end to the destruction and the slaughter that's happening around the world. God, we pray for Palestine and Gaza and Rafa. We pray for your peace to take hold there. Pray for an end to the anger that has been driving this. We pray for an end to the war in Ukraine. God, we ask that again, you would bring peace, true shalom, peace and justice where so far there has only been destruction. And God, we pray for those other parts of the world as well, Yemen, Sudan. We pray for those places in the world that are experiencing natural disasters, earthquakes and floods, drought and famine. God, we ask that you would be providing, and not only that you would be providing, but that you would be using us. The, <laughs> we claim to be your people's God, and so we ask that you would be sending us into those places in the world that we could bring about kingdom work, feeding the hungry, working for peace, proclaiming Christ with what we say and with what we do. And so, God, we pray for our missionaries around the world that we support. We ask that you would be upholding them that they could continue to be ambassadors for Christ Jesus. And God, we ask that in our own homes, in our own lives, in our own neighborhoods, we would be encouraged to be missionaries, to reach out and to care for those in need, to check on neighbors with love, to speak truth and to speak your gospel with everything that we do and everything that we say. And God, we can only do this by your Holy Spirit. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to be sent and stirred up in us once again. And we know that when we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, we are signing up. We are not only asking for your will to be done, but we are volunteering. So it is with boldness that we say it the way Jesus taught us to say it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 21, kind of back in the Sermon on the Mount where we spent so much time a few months ago with the Beatitudes. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that if you are angry with a sister or brother, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire in Gehenna. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come back and offer your gift. Our second reading is from Genesis chapter 4.
beginning at verse 1. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out into the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark upon Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we go any further, would you please pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for this day, for this opportunity to hear your word, to, to reflect on it, to inwardly digest it, that we might better know you and know your word for us, how it can guide us and shape us in our lives. And so, God, we ask for your word to speak now by your Holy Spirit. And God, whatever is not from you, whatever is not your word by your Holy Spirit, may it fall to the ground like dust. But may your word remain. May it preserve us and keep us in your grace. Amen. As I said, we're kind of, we're, we're starting week two of a sermon series here, uh, Family Dynamics of Genesis and um, finishing the preparation for that series and, and kind of looking at things and going back through Genesis once more, um, it's always a little shocking. It's always a little shocking to read Genesis, and if you haven't read it in a long time, I would encourage you to read it this month as we're going through it. Um, it is shocking in how different the culture was back then and that far away. It is not the culture that we have today. Uh, for good and for ill, perhaps, but there are certainly some things, um, cousin marrying and things like that, that uh, definitely not cultural acceptable, probably for the best. Um, but there's also things that surprise me that are more, more pleasant and less culture shock. And one thing that uh, I had a few people come and talk to me about after the sermon last week, and I, I wanted to address that, and we see a little bit more of it this week. When we talked about Adam and Eve, and we talked about God kind of declaring the consequences for Adam and Eve's sin, there's a few ways to interpret that. And the best way 
that I have found to interpret that is not an absolutely wrathful, angry Lord casting Adam and Eve out, but rather a parent who is not so much angry, but disappointed. How many of y'all remember those interactions with mom and dad? How many of you are the mom or dad who currently has to be not so much angry, but disappointed? Saw a few hands go up, okay. Of course, if you remember those moments with your parents, sometimes you wish they had been angry rather than just disappointed. Anger you can expect, anger you maybe even could deal with. But the disappointment hits you harder sometimes because anger you can throw your walls up real quick and be defensive against. Disappointment makes you reflect on your own choices and the consequences that those choices have now brought. So no, I don't think that God is particularly angry with Adam and Eve as he addresses them, as he reveals to them the consequences of their choices, reveals to them that they will work and toil, that there will be suffering and thorns, and that they will die rather than live forever in a garden paradise with him. And that even in that moment, as much as death is a problem for us, it is also a stopgap to the problems that are, con the, the, a stopgap to the consequences that our sinful choices have brought upon us. What I mean by that is, had we been able to fall into sin, become enslaved to sin, and also live forever in a world broken and marred by sin, things would only have gotten worse and worse and worse. So in that sense, death is a wall. Death is a wall that prevents us from sinning so much and in such terrible ways that we destroy not only ourselves, but the people around us and the world around us until there is nothing left. Death is a consequence for sin, but it is also a merciful stop on the spiral that sin pulls us into. And we see that here in our story today as the sinful choices of the earliest humans that we know of, that we see in Scripture, are not merely eating a fruit and defying a direct instruction from the Lord, but now to, in our anger, in Cain's anger, commit premeditated murder of his own brother. Sin is spiraling quickly. And Cain, jealous of his brother and the favor that his brother has found in God's eyes, chooses to destroy his brother rather than to endure the shame of not being the favored one any further. Jesus' words are powerful here, as we read in Matthew 5, and it's worth taking note. It's worth taking note because this is something that people have grappled with, pastors, theologians, church leaders throughout the ages. Because Jesus is not calling us to an easy interpretation, right? Jesus is not calling us to a legalistic approach to our faith the way the Pharisees of his days did it. Nor is he calling us to a relativistic, well, you know, follow your heart, do what you think is right, chase your bliss, and everything will work out in the end. Jesus is calling us away from that spectrum of pure conservative moralism and pure liberal do what feels good. He's not even in the middle between those two poles. He is completely outside of that. And he makes that clear by not only citing the law, citing these things from God, these commandments from God that we find in Genesis and Exodus, but he's taking it that much further. Jesus said, do not, excuse me, <clears throat> you have heard that it was said, 
to those of ancient times, those who received the covenant of Moses, you shall not murder, sixth commandment, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say that if you are angry with a sister or a brother, and if you insult a sister or a brother, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. Now, I know we already confessed sins earlier, but I'm going to ask for a little more honest confession. How many of you have ever said to a literal brother or sister in your own family or a brother or sister in Christ, perhaps, you fool. You, the, the Greek word is actually, basically, the, the, the direct English translation is moron. Anybody called somebody a moron before? I'll raise my hand. I've done it, right? Okay. It's, it's an election season, so we're probably all going to be doing it more than we should coming up. We shouldn't, but it's going to happen at least some of the time. How many of you have ever been angry with a sister or brother? Okay. So what on earth is Jesus saying here? Are we all doomed? Doomed to a hell of fire? Well, yes, without him we are. Without confessing, without receiving what Jesus is trying to give, we are doomed. Just as Cain was doomed. Jesus will, of course, unveil more and more of that gospel that grace, that forgiveness, and we will be talking about that again in a moment. But for now, it's worth staying on this. Because in the law of Moses, in the, the covenant commandments that were poured out by God through Moses, through that journey of 40 years through the wilderness from slavery in Egypt to return to the promised land and life as God would have them live it, there are very clear instructions but Jesus is revealing more of what the point of those instructions were, the, the, the spirit behind the law. Because at this point, we've reached this legalistic interpretation, we've talked about this before, where the Pharisees not only uphold the law, but want to come up with the most minute applications of that law and, and, and the the way to, to basically build a, a perfect Jewish society around that law and with clear delineation. And the best example of that would be how we introduce the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because an expert in the law, somebody who works with the Pharisees to come up with these minute applications of the law, comes up to Jesus and asks him, after an introduction of, you know, a little bit more about the law, he says, and who is my neighbor, right? If I'm supposed to love my neighbor as I love myself, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan where a man is attacked and beaten and left for dead, dying, bleeding out on the road, and the first person to come across him is a priest. And the priest is like, Ugh. might end up like that guy, go on by. The next person is a judge, an expert in the law, someone who knows God's word backwards and forwards, sees the guy bleeding out on the road and says, Ugh, don't have time for this, can't risk stopping to help this guy. It might be bait. It might be another ambush waiting to happen. Goes on by. Third person is a Samaritan. And a Samaritan was an enemy of the Jewish people. They were seen as half-breeds and traitors to the Jewish identity and the Jewish cause. They had long ago lost what the Jewish people saw as God's blessings of, of covenant people with them. They had intermingled with all the other local tribes, and they'd been absolutely crushed by the Greeks, and now were collaborating with the Greeks and the Romans even more than, than the Jewish people were. But Jesus lifts up the Samaritan as the hero, who does risk it all to stop and to help the man, to bring him to an end, to pay for his health care, to ensure that the man not only survives, but has everything that he needs. So Jesus asks the expert in law, who was a neighbor to that man? And the guy has to say, the Samaritan. And Jesus says, go 
and do likewise. Jesus' interpretation of the law, both here in, in Matthew 5 and in the story of the Good Samaritan, is not that you can come up with the most minute application so you know in this circumstance you do this and in that circumstance you do this. Jesus' interpretation of the law is a matter not only of action, but also of the head and the heart. And so when Jesus says, when you feel that anger bubbling up inside you against a brother or a sister, take warning, right? Pump the brakes. Go before the Lord in prayer. Because if you have the, the sacrifice that you have traveled days to get to Jerusalem for, paid hundreds if not thousands of dollars in our equivalent of money to, uh, to have the pristine lamb, and to wait in line for hours as thousands upon thousands of faithful Judeans step up to take their turn at the temple and to offer up a sacrifice for the forgiveness of their sins before the Lord God in the presence of his people in the most holy place that you could ever go to as a follower of God. And you realize that you have something a grudge, a wedge between you and your sister or brother, drop it. Undo all the work, all the time, and all the money that you've invested in that sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins and go and be reconciled to your sister or brother. Jesus is using such powerful language for what seems like such minute stuff to feel angry at somebody. To say, you fool to your wife or your husband, to your sister or your brother, to your coworker, He is using the language of heaven and hell, life and death, for such simple things as thinking a nasty thought towards someone. Because that is how sin takes hold. God says to Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. God went straight to Cain as this anger began to bubble up in his heart, in his head, as he began to think about how he might get his revenge on Abel and act on this jealous anger. Cain did not go to God. Cain did not drop everything and seek to be reconciled with his brother. Cain kept the anger that was in his heart and that was coming up with a plan in his head. And like a little fire, he kept adding, kindling to it, blowing the embers so that they might take light and become a raging inferno. And meanwhile, that's exactly what sin was doing with Cain. Growing it until it would be uncontrollable and unstoppable in his own heart. Jesus has such harsh language, such severe words when it comes to matters of the law, when it comes to our own head and our own heart, because sin is lurking around the corner. Sin is ready to take hold of us. So that what starts as a natural enough thought, right? We've all been angry with someone. We'll be angry with somebody next week. We'll say something stupid that we'll have to come back and apologize for and be reconciled with the person that we said the nasty thing to. But if we don't take it to God, if we don't drop everything and go to God with our anger, then sin takes hold of us. And we do things which we might not be able to be reconciled to the person we did them to. There was no forgiveness from Abel for Cain because Abel couldn't give it. Abel was dead, and his blood cried out from the ground to the Lord. 
there's some wonderful parallels between Genesis 3 and Genesis 4. As we talked about last week, God already knew what Adam and Eve had done. He was not surprised. This is the first time hearing of it that you've eaten of the fruit, right? But he wants to engage with them the same way he wants to engage with us. He wants to give us an opportunity to reach out, to confess. And so he's in the garden. He's walking along the same path that he usually walks with Adam and Eve, and they're not there. And so he goes and he calls for them. He says, where were you? And they say, we were hiding. Much in the same way, God calls out to Cain and says, where is your brother Abel? God is giving Cain the opportunity to at least confess this much. The deed has been done, but maybe you could tell me more. But the walls are up. Cain says, I don't know where my brother is. Am I his keeper? Right? I'm not his babysitter. He's a big boy. He's got a whole herd of sheep he takes care of. He can take care of himself. But God is already aware. God is already aware of what has happened. What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out from the very ground upon which you spilled it. And once again, there are consequences for this sin. Cain, who loved to till the earth, to farm, to garden, to bring forth produce, to feed himself and his family, is no longer able to continue in his vocation. To receive the joy of planting a seed, watching it grow, and bringing forth a harvest. Not only that, he knows that he has to leave. And now he fears that the first person that encounters him will see what a terrible person he is. But God, once again, in the midst of these heavy, burdensome consequences for sin, also provides a mercy, provides a mark of protection that will keep those who would kill Cain outright as an exile and a fugitive from doing so. Even in the midst of these hard consequences for sin, God's mercy bubbles up to the surface, reveals itself. God is not angry, wrathful, and eradicating sinners. He is keeping them, giving them more opportunities to confess to find forgiveness. So, when you're angry, when you are ready to harbor that anger and let it grow in your heart, to visualize all the ways that you might find purchase for that anger, by harming the person you're angry with. Jesus makes it clear. That is the time to drop everything. To bring your anger to God. To talk with him. To confess it. To go to the person you are angry with and to be reconciled to them. It's very easy to be angry with people, people that have harmed us, people that do things that we cannot understand or agree with. But the longer we hold on to it, the longer it holds on to us, and sin has a greater purchase over our heads and our hearts. It's not a once and for all deal. It's something we have to do every day. And so, when you feel anger creeping in, remember that sin is right behind it, lurking. And the best thing we can do is to be open and honest with God, and open and honest with the people we love and trust, and yes, open and honest with the people who provoke that anger, that we might be reconciled to them, that we might receive God's love and show it to them and hopefully even receive it from them.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed by someone who loved him but didn't know what to do with the anger that was bubbling up inside of him. That very night that Jesus knew he would be betrayed, wrongfully arrested and imprisoned, and crucified for the sake of our sin, for the sake of our misplaced anger. Jesus took the bread that was on the table, and he gave thanks to God, and he broke it. And he gave it to everyone at the table, even Judas, whose anger had already caught hold of him. He broke the bread and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to God. And he gave the cup for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant written in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins, even the sins of anger. Do this in remembrance of me. And so every time that we come to this table, we confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that we have things in our life, sin and, other, and anger, that is uncontrollable. But when we come before the Lord, we receive not only the bread and the fruit of the vine, we also receive God's holy presence. We receive the body of Christ, and we are encouraged and assured that our sins are forgiven and that we have the power to move beyond sin, to leave our anger and to walk forward in God's Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the host of this table. All who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, the giver of life, the one who forgives and brings grace is invited to join us at this table. And once again, there are gluten-free options uh, that include both the cup and the wafer on the inner ring of the tray. So in just a moment, we'll invite you to come forward. But for now, I'd invite the elders to come forward and help me serve. Probably do both trays at the time. Both trays. to make us 
And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body healed our earth. As we
hand. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let's sing. We are children, sons of a children, So everyone that was here on the steps a little earlier, for the first time ever, you can vote in a congregational meeting in like two minutes. So stick around, and everybody else uh, that's a voting member, we'd ask you please, as a birthday request from me, to stick around for a very brief congregational meeting, and to then go straight to Grail Landing, Grail Park, uh, for the baptism of Kiana and Micah. But wherever you're going and whatever you do next, may the peace of Christ go with you. Wherever he is sending you, and Christ is sending you, May he guide you through the wilderness. May he protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May Christ bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace.